Welcome back, Warriors. Quainine DeLuise Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. We cover everything from native sovereignty, treaties, and land back to decolonization, reconciliation, and how you can support the struggle. So if you're interested in hearing from native peoples from sovereign nations all over Turtle Island, talk about what it's like on the front lines of Indigenous resistance, resurgence, and revitalization, then this is the podcast for you. And today's podcast is going to be so awesome. My guest is a mover and shaker in the media industry, and she is literally putting people's voices and stories in the forefront. So you don't want to miss this. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Warrior Life Podcast. Today we have a really exciting podcast with a real live media pro. And I'm not even kidding, you name it. And Kim Wheeler has done it in media, both Indigenous media and non-Indigenous media. Now get this for a professional CV, and I'm going to bring her in here because her professional CV is just outstanding. I couldn't even list everything. So she's a writer, she's a communication specialist, she's a producer, she's a host, she's a business owner, and she does it all for print media, radio media, TV, special events, in person, you name it. I don't even know how she does it all. She has more than three decades of experience and has written for major outlets like Chatelaine, the New York Times, Winnipeg Free Press, CBC, the Canadian Press. I mean, that's only scratching the surface of her experience. So can you literally see why I admire her so much? Welcome to the Warrior Life Podcast, Kim. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Pam. Wow, what a crazy opening. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I guess I really have done all that. I don't know how I've done it either, but you know, <laughs> that, it has to do with paying the bills. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, you know, people don't often know how much they've actually accomplished until someone sits back and starts reading all of the things and they're like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, you know, I've done a few things, but I can only imagine that when you're in the midst of it and you're trying to do a thousand things at once, you don't really have time to think of, hey, I did that. What a great accomplishment. <laughs> yeah. Well, right back at you. I mean, I look at all the things that you do and you've done and, and I'm like, wow, like, am I doing enough? No, no. <laughs> I'm following you, Kim, of course. So like, there you go. You're just making just, it. You just have to run for national life. chief one day and I'll <laughs> put up with you. Oh, thanks, Kim. Okay. Well, I have a bazillion questions for you. I want to talk about some of your work. Obviously, we can't get to everything because you've just done so much, but there's some things that I really want to talk to you about. But before that, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit about yourself and where you're from. Sure. I, I love this part because sometimes I, I kind of wonder how to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Kim Wheeler. I'm an Anishinaabe and Mohawk. I am 60 Scoop. So I am actually registered at Seguin First Nation, but that's not where my maternal bloodline comes from. It actually comes from Sandy Bay. And my paternal bloodline, I do believe, is Mohawk from Six Nations, although I'm still searching for my birth father uh, and kind of doing my research and getting a bit closer. So hopefully I'll have that side of my life figured out soon. Um, I live in Winnipeg, Treaty 1 territory. I have three children, two stepchildren, and they're all adults and grown up. And I'm married to Jordan Wheeler, who is a uh, TV writer as well. Well, well, that's convenient. <laughs> I mean, yeah. at least a all the kids are adults, and I know what that's like. Phew, I have a little bit of time for myself, and B that you have a partner that shares a similar interest because that that's got to be helpful. Oh, so helpful! Like we uh, bounce ideas off of each other all the time, and and sometimes we take each other's ideas, and sometimes we just smile and nod and go okay and walk away. <laughs> 
And I can only imagine you get to commiserate together like, oh, I want to pull my hair out on this project. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, before we get started, and I know that you know, you've talked a lot about your background and you did this like amazing audio production about your background. And it's a background, like you said, in terms of 60 Scoop that so many other Indigenous peoples um, have lived through. Well, some have lived through, uh, some mm -hmm. have not. And it's really put a hamper in our connections. You know, I think Canada has always very much wanted to separate us from not just culture, but our families and the land. And then that journey back is often very difficult. Why did you, why did you want to do like this audio? It, it sounds like a documentary, really, this audio documentary about that journey, because I can only imagine that that's got to be really painful. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to do it, at, you know, and maybe kind of egotistically now thinking back about it. I wanted to share the journey of being a 60 scoop survivor because I felt like I had a platform and I knew how to tell story and I had a voice and I had other friends who I could interview and, and, you know, share part of their story as well. Um, because Canadians don't know the story about the 60 scoop and that it is a continuation of uh, residential schools just like CFS is a continuation of the 60s scoop. And I just felt like it was time to share my personal story. And, you know, of course, being a journalist and storyteller, the hook was um, we were getting this compensation uh, money from the federal government for being adopted out, being torn away from our culture and our community. And uh, it was, for me, it was just the time to, to tell it. And, you know, what I pitched and what, what the documentary ended up actually becoming are kind of vastly different. But sometimes that's how story goes and you just have to roll with, roll with it. And, yeah, you're right. It was, a very, uh, it was a very difficult story to tell and to share, even though I've shared pit, bits of my story before with people and online and in person, but to put it out there in a way where it's, you know, now it's out there for everybody all the time. Mm. It was, it was really difficult to, to voice some of those things that happened. Um, the, you know, like the fact that I was raised by racist white parents, that they were abusive, that they were emotionally abusive, they were physically abusive and they were sexually abusive. Um, but you know at the end of it spoiler alert or not spoiler alert <laughs> i'm okay <laughs> like Aww. i am okay and i have a great yeah. life and i love like i love living and i live every day like i really believe live every day to the fullest mm -hmm. and i rarely say no to things because you just never know where the day is going to take you and what's going to happen mm -hmm. and and as my dear friend jackie black who we lost earlier this year used to say, tomorrow shall take care of itself. Hmm. But you know, that's a good way to think about it. There's what well, you can't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow's just going to come along and it's going to be what it is. So yeah. I, I appreciate that. And uh, if it's okay with you, I'll post a link to that documentary so that people who maybe haven't heard it yet can listen to it. And one of the things I really admire about you is that you always have the right timing. So when you think about the 60 scoop settlement, Canadians would be going, first of all, what? What's the 60 scoop? And second of all, what's this settlement about? I don't understand. Because uh, in some people's minds, they might think, oh, adoptions are a beautiful thing, you know, because in their context, it might have been, but not mm -hmm. understanding the historical context. So you, you've you got it at the right time when people would be asking those questions and wanting to know. And I think it's just such a powerful story. And I think the way that you are today is literally a testament to the little heart inside of you and the warrior spirit and obviously all of the people around you because you just, you're just so phenomenal. As a person, you know, and you support people like me behind the scenes, helping me with things that I don't know, and lots of others, like, you just continue to lift up other people. And I think that's one of the positive things that we should get out of 
um, all of these experiences that we've had, the warriors that are mm -hmm. here trying to help other people to make sure that never happens. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's, and it's part of being a journalist is, mm -hmm. is sharing and telling other people's stories. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's That's not, right. yeah. Like it's not about myself, even though my, I finally did tell my story, <laughs> but it is about like, uplifting the community and and sharing all of these incredible stories and that's you know like when I first started my journalism career way back in the 1900s oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah that's right it literally is the 1900s yeah, right? it was the 1900s when I started my journalism career um I actually I was not in touch with my community or my culture I knew I was First Nations back then we said Indian or Native. Um, I knew I had the tiny bit of information that I was Mohawk. I didn't have the information but back then that I was Anishinaabe. Um, <clears throat> and one of our first assignments in journalism school was to write a profile piece on whoever we wanted. And and I was always really growing up, I was always super interested in the entertainment community. And I read, you know, like 16 Magazine and Tiger Beat and my walls were covered in photographs of all the hot young stars. And uh, that's where my interests lied. So when I had to write this profile piece, I decided I would write a piece on an actor. And long story short, I ended up profiling uh, Dakota House, who was the star of North of 60 at the time. And, and that's how I started covering the Indigenous community. That is you know, like part of yourself, just what I was talking about, you know, by covering that, it's another profile on an Indigenous person. It's celebrating the positive that we have, what we're contributing, the trailblazers. And I just, I love that about you. And speaking of journalism, you actually were educated in journalism, weren't you? I was. I went to uh, McEwen, well, it's McEwen University now, but it was Grant McEwen College back then. And I had to, so I did a two year uh, journalism uh, diploma and cool in, in Edmonton. And uh, it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I like there's, I think there was like about 30 or 35 of us, and not very many of us stayed in journalism, actually. Hmm. But you, you did, you kind of stayed, I guess there's like journalism. And then if anyone were to follow your CDV, you just kept like adding on and adding on and adding on and expanding so that you're in this like great big media bubble of things that you do. But before we get to some of my favorite things that you do, can you talk about like journalism, like why you went into journalism? Because right out of you know, journalism school, you ended up being a reporter for the Edmonton Journal, you were an editor at the Canadian Press. Can you talk about like that and what it was like back then? Because things are, you know, different today than they were back then. Yeah. Um, well, after I graduated, so during my first and second year, the Edmonton Journal was looking for somebody to work on their sports stats page. And they had this really antiquated system and you had to do all this crazy math to, to uh, l figure out, you know, who the top in hockey, who the top uh, goal scorers were, where the teams lined up, who was in first, who was in third, who was last. And this math happened like every night. And every night I screw the stats up because I'm a writer, not a mathematician. Numbers are my nemesis. And uh, and I can somehow I convinced them to give me the cub reporter job in the newsroom with five other uh, and, and journalism babies out there. Um, yeah, and, and so I did did the summer internship with the Edmonton Journal, and and you know back in the '90s we did there was no internet, there were no websites, so everybody got their news from the newspapers or from radio or the six o'clock news. Um, newspapers were really like really really huge, and so to get a the summer internship at a daily newspaper in Canada was was a really big deal. Um, and I don't think I appreciated that as much as I do now, but as I did back then, like I felt that because Edmonton had a journalism school that 
naturally we should just have uh, journalism grads from uh, from the same city working in the major dailies, but that's not how it worked. And competition was really stiff. And I think because, you know, I did show up and, and worked really hard in that mm -hmm. stats uh, in the sports section that they decided to put me uh, in the newsroom. I think that was part of it. I don't know. I never asked. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's what I mean. You just keep going. You work really, really, really hard. And, you know, you you make your own way. And I'm just thinking as you're talking, oh, gosh, if that was me, I, I cannot do math. I cannot do percentages. I cannot do like I, I wouldn't have been able to right. do that, even if I tried really, really, really hard. So oh, yeah. on you. I know. And the editor in chief, the first thing he opened every day was the sports page and looked at the stats. And if the hockey stats were wrong, they were getting calls. And I'm sure they got calls after every shift I worked. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's okay now. <laughs> but it is true. Like, you know, back then you think about it, no cell phones, no internet. Like now anyone can have a blog if they want to. And I think, you know, there's a good thing about that. But back then it just goes to show just how important it was that you were trailblazing because I can only assume maybe I'm wrong but everyone who worked at the Edmonton Journal or the Canadian Press they weren't all Indigenous. No no they weren't there was one other Indigenous journalist who worked at the Edmonton Journal um, and she was she was a bit older than me and uh, I don't know she kind of intimidated me. <laughs> Oh, no. like we're, we're friends now like we're friends on Facebook yeah. and and she's really really lovely and I don't she doesn't work in journalism anymore but uh, okay. but back then I mean I was a baby so everybody <laughs> I'm sure everybody attempted me back then it's just trying to you know keep my head down and and do the work and and uh, bring home a paycheck to feed those kids well there's a lot to be said for hard work and the grind, you know, there's so many people who just want to skip over it to go from whatever education or training they have to, you know, CEO. And, and maybe that works for some people, but there's a lot to be said for putting in the work, getting the experience, making your mistakes, learning from them, because I can only imagine that the work you do today, which is everywhere in media, has been informed by all of those mistakes and experiences and all of that knowledge you gained from all of the different positions. Because like I said, here you were doing the writing, then you're doing the editing at the Canadian Free Press. And then all of a sudden you were at CBC Radio. And for Canada, that's a mega job, especially back then when again, the lack of social media, you're working at CBC Radio where there's a lot of people that still rely on radio. Like think about all of the remote reserves where they have radios or they didn't have internet, for example, and everyone's listening to either the res radio or CBC radio or, you know what I mean? And yeah. CBC is like so iconic. So how on earth did you get into the CBC radio biz? Because I knew somebody who knew somebody. <laughs> oh, that helps. <laughs> but but so this is what happened. So I was working in Edmonton um, and I couldn't get a job at CBC in Edmonton. They would not hire me. I got an interview once, but that was about it. Um, I don't think I'm like, I don't, I just don't think my personality was the right fit for them back then. And I don't know how many Indigenous people actually work for CBC Edmonton to this day, if any. Um like I would be very happy to know who works at CBC Edmonton in that newsroom if they are Indigenous or not. Um, but I moved back to Winnipeg because I was I lived in I was born and raised in Winnipeg and then I moved away for 18 years. That's when I did my schooling and got my start in in journalism. And then I moved back to Winnipeg um, in 2007. And a friend of mine was dating the HR person at CBC. And so I gave her my uh, my resume and said like if there's ever any openings let me know and then one day I got a call uh, from a producer and they were actually looking for specifically looking for an indigenous producer to work on a show called Revision Quest uh, which was a, a myth busting show about indigenous people and it was part comedy and it was part kind of talk and and uh 
they invited me in to talk about the show and I thought, oh, this is fantastic. And they made me an offer. And, uh, and so I accepted it and that's how I got into the CBC. And how was it? How was this revisionist show? Because I'd have to think that myth busting would be, I can see how you could make it funny because of some of the stereotypes about us are just so ridiculous, yeah. but also very easy in a sense, because if you've lived that life of always hearing those stereotypes and you know the truth, it must have been kind of interesting to work on for you. Yeah, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. We had a great we had a great host and we had a team of producers. Most of them, um, we had some non, some non-Indigenous producers and some Indigenous producers. And of course, you know, to get ahead of the CBC, you have to keep your head down. You have to be a yes person. You have to not rock the boat. So of course, the, no Indigenous person has led an Indigenous show at the CBC. So Revision Quest was, out, was actually led by a white guy. Um, actually, who I love and adore, Doug Holmes. He was one of the best bosses. I always have to shout him out because he Aww. taught me a lot. And he's always been really supportive of my career. And so I really, uh, really appreciate all the work he put in. But um, the first season, so we it was a, called a summer replacement show. So if you're a CBC mm -hmm. listener, you know that in the summertime, they bring a crop of new, new shows for summertime listeners because everybody wants light fair and happy fair yeah yeah yeah, yeah. let's enjoy the sunshine and the beach and listen to the <laughs> show. um so we did 10 episodes and after the summer they sent me back to another show and and i was like you know what we need to do we need to pitch this for a second season and everybody's like no they never do second seasons for summer shows and they're like don't you think like like 10 episodes that was enough and i'm like are you kidding like there's so many other stories we can tell and they brought us back for four seasons oh my gosh yeah so, so we did not only did you summer do summer show season. but you kind of like broke with their norms their tradition of no we don't do more seasons but you know you made it happen like yeah. i'm sure with your team but that's you've got to be proud of that yeah absolutely and you know so then we discovered uh, like a bunch of indigenous journalists out there across CBC land oh, wow. um, who we got to come and and produce because that was one of my things because I sat close to where Doug was so him and I talked a lot and I was like like let's adios these white producers <laughs> let's get these indigenous yeah, producers yeah. in here and so they had you know like because it's the CBC, they had to talk to their bosses. We had to talk to their bosses, and we had to con people from across the country. And and so we had people like Wab Gishig Rice, Wab Canoe wow. before he became the NDP leader here in Manitoba. Angela Starrett did an yeah. episode. Um, who else did? Who else did an episode? We brought in Lauren Olson, who did a this episode on being on Two Spirit. There, wow. were there were many like so it, it was yeah it was a real training ground for people and because you know because somebody like Doug was there and he was willing to listen to me to take a chance on people who may not have told stories in that way because they were news reporters mm -hmm. I knew that like let's just give them an opportunity Give them an opportunity to either say yes or say no. Like we can't be deciding for people. No. And and I think you know I think that helped. At least I hoped it helped a lot of people look at how they were telling their own stories and what the possibilities were out there for uh, for them. Well, clearly, because I don't know if people think enough about the power of incubation or the power of mentoring or any of that, because you think about that, everyone knows who those people are now. Everyone knows Angela Starrett. Everyone knows, all, you know, some of the people that you brought into that show. And so you think that's a part of their learning, their experience and their exposure. And, you know, all of these things add up to help people in their own careers. So I, what I really like is sometimes you'll see people in an industry and like they're the only indigenous one or the only woman, but they don't 
take the time or effort or they're fearful to try to promote other people. They just kind of keep their head down and try to make it within that, you know, non-Indigenous system. But you were like, you know what, let's try to do this for other people too. And I can only imagine, you know how they say there's like this butterfly effect? Mm -hmm. There's no way to ever know all the ways in which you have helped other people grow and helped shows grow and helped other people change and just general Canadians, what they've learned. Because there was another show. Weren't you also associated with Unreserved? I was. I was uh, I was an associate producer with Unreserved for three seasons. Um, you know, full disclosure, Rosanna Deerchild is one of my best friends. We just actually had dinner together on Friday night. Um, and, you know, we hang out a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, you know, it came time to hire a senior producer and they, you know, I applied, three other Indigenous journalists applied and they didn't interview any of us. And, you know, I think that people there may have heard that I was challenging to work with because, you know, I wanted the best for yes. for the show and I pushed them to do better and be better and, you know, upgrade their language and let their language evolve. And, and I had a different way of thinking, like, instead of thinking, you know, this is how it should work as a yeah. pyramid, like this is the boss and everybody listens. Yeah, yeah. It's like, let's work in a circle. Yeah. And everybody is equal in the circle. And and they weren't really jazzed about that whole circular idea of mm -hmm. creating something um, that could be so incredibly special. So they didn't interview any of us. <laughs> and uh, they seconded a white person to lead the show. Oh, wow. Um, and to which I said, all right, then, fuck you, I quit. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was like, like, I just, I didn't care. So I wrote this. I, and I actually just read, read my resignation letter last month again. I read it to a friend of mine. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is like an epic resignation letter. And I told them everything I was thinking about, about their management style and, and how they treated us as indigenous women and as indigenous people. And that, you know, it was clear to me that we were just cogs in a wheel and they didn't really give a shit about indigenous story. They wanted story told the way they wanted it and they wanted the stories that they wanted to hear and not what was um, what was important to us. Wow. And, and I was like, okay, yeah. Like, obviously you guys, you're not going to make me a senior producer because you know you can't control me. Right. And as soon as I figured that out, I was like, I, yeah, this is never going to happen. So why would I stick around mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. I have an entire world out there that I can do things with? And I didn't have, I, you know, when I first made the decision, I didn't have a safety net. Oh, wow. Um, but it only took one phone call and... I had another job. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. So you know what? Uh, that that takes a lot of bravery, especially without a, a safety net, right? Like you're not just independently wealthy with millions of dollars in the bank. But you know what? To your credit too, it also shows that you were at a stage where you knew what was right or wrong in terms of Indigenous content. You knew what the goal was for promoting Indigenous voices and spaces and stories. And you also had to have had enough strength and knowledge in your own skills and abilities to know that you deserve better. And I think about all of the Indigenous peoples who don't think that, who don't think, they don't have confidence in their own abilities. And so the way that you support people and mentor them and uh, help them along. It's like you will help people be as as strong in their own abilities as you were to make that decision because that couldn't be easy, right? I mean, that's not only not financially easy, but you know, it's like, darn it, I wish the situation was different because you could have, you know, made so many contributions, but it uh, clearly wasn't to be. And 
it certainly hasn't detracted from your career because you have gone on to do so many other amazing things. Like in addition to doing all of this stuff, you know, CBC radio and reporter and journalist and writing, you've also worked in media relations for a native organization. You've been in communications, helping other people, and you have your own consulting business and have worked with huge clients like the Manitoba Festival. I mean, for anyone not from Manitoba, that is massive. It is so amazing, that festival. Uh, you've worked with the Indigenous Music Awards. Again, this isn't a small thing. This is a massive project and the Royal Manitoba Theatre. So you're kicking ass and taking names in Manitoba and, and really helping to push Indigenous voices. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to be an Indigenous woman entrepreneur? Because again, unless you just happen to be independently wealthy with millions of dollars and it doesn't matter if it works or not, you, there must be a lot of blood, sweat and tears into that kind of work, like being in your own business. Yeah, for sure. For sure there is. And, you you know, you're always thinking, you know, three steps ahead. So right now I have several, I have, well, two podcasts on the go that I'm producing, but they're, you know, they're limited series. So come March, um, essentially I'm unemployed again, or I don't have any clients and people, you know, I've heard people tell me, um, Kim, you're always so busy. Like, we don't know if you, you even have time for us. It's like, like, like you always call me because you don't know when one project is going to end and when another one's going to begin or if I'm in the process of deciding between projects because sometimes there are projects that I think oh, okay I should take it because I don't know if I'm going to have something else come up and maybe that project isn't the right project for me and then something else does come along and I've been really lucky I've been like so lucky that way um, that my phone, my phone keeps ringing. Um, you know, I've made it my goal in the last couple of years to try and exclusively work with women. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that is, uh, that's a pretty big turn for me as well. So like, I still, you know, like a, there are still, uh, indigenous men, but for the most part, it's Indigenous women who I am exclusively working with. And it's, it's so much fun to work with women and just, <laughs> I come off like things like this and go, oh man, like we are so amazing. Yes. <laughs> so amazing. You know, I did work with the Indigenous screen office, right? And Jesse Wente was the executive director, wow. but all the, everybody else, while I was there, we were all women. Wow. Right? We did the anti up podcast. Yes. All women. Yes. <laughs> and just to keep working with Indigenous women and seeing how amazing it is, it just empowers me to keep going forward. And then looking at other female entrepreneurs, Indigenous mm -hmm. female entrepreneurs, right? And um, lending, you know, lending my support to them and and it's amazing, like how, you know, a like on social media by somebody can really elevate how you feel. And, yeah. and, you know, for the longest time, I didn't think of myself that way, like that my opinion would mean, hmm. mean something to people. But now lately, I've been like, I think I'm just going to have to embrace that fact. And, yes. and you know tell people how much I like them or I like their work or yes. this is a great show or this is a great idea and I love you know this story and yeah and you so know what Kim you, you've got to do that because you've always I think with Indigenous women so much they always have more power and influence and experience to share and to give they just emanate that you know and, and it's you know, Indigenous peoples, we all have our own, you know, skills and talents, but there's something about a little collective of women and how we relate to one another and the unique challenges of Indigenous women. And, you know, I'll tell I'll tell you just a quick little story, something I don't know if I've ever told you, but 
one day you contacted me and you said, you know, Pam, have you ever considered, you know, putting one of your podcasts in like a festival, say the Imaginative Festival or something like that? And the fact that you reached out to me for that, I was like, oh my gosh, Kim Wheeler just reached out to me and said I should put my podcast in a festival or something. I, I was literally floored, you know, because I was working in a realm outside of politics, outside of the advocacy that I was doing, venturing into something where I have no skills, no training. I'm total amateur learning everything on YouTube. Thanks, YouTube. Uh, and for you to say that just gave me this huge boost because someone probably wouldn't just randomly reach out if you were doing such a horrible job. And the fact that I was brave enough to, to do it and I was like, oh my goodness. And then, you know, a couple of years later, I just kept doing it and I ended up winning an and award. For my work award. award. Yes. I know. I was like, that's because of Kim Wheeler. That's literally because of Kim Wheeler, everybody. I would never have even started to put my podcast there. And so because of you, I did that. And you made me feel a little bit more secure in the things that I'm doing. And I can, there must be countless people that feel the same way. And so I just wanted you to know that your voice, your support and encouragement, it actually means a lot to people like me and, and to, to so many others. Because I think about various industries, you know, mm -hmm. business, law, politics, the media, all of those things always excluded Indigenous peoples. And then when they started to include Indigenous peoples, primarily Indigenous men. You know, not exclusively, but primarily, especially in like universities, mm -hmm. if they hired any academics, it was Indigenous men. And so Indigenous women were, again, you know, 10 steps behind. And we've managed to just, you know, kick ass and take names like you, be trailblazers, but lift people up as we go. And that's what I like so much about you, because full disclosure, people, I love Kim Wheeler and I love all she does. And we do work uh, time to time on things. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have her on here. But one of the shows that she's worked on that has just become this like massive, massive show is Turtle Island Talks on Sirius XM. And it's also on the Indigiverse. She's the producer, she's helped write and curate it. And I'm a host on those shows. Just the fact that Kim would even ask me. And, and the way we all collaborate is just so much fun. And so for people who don't know about Turtle Island Talks, can you talk a little bit about it? Because here's a shameless self-promotion. <laughs> uh, we won the Canadian Radio Awards in 2021 for Best Canadian Multi-Market Program. So Kim, Tell them about how wonderful your show is. Uh, well, it's actually your show. I feel like <laughs> it's our show, even, you know, like even though we're the producers and stuff, it's always the host who gets all the glory, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a show that we created on Sirius XM. It, we do four episodes a year, so one every quarter, and we have our next one coming up uh, next week, which Pam and I need to talk about after this show. <laughs> and uh, it's each episode, each episode has a different focus. So one, we focused all on health and we had, um, we do like a little panel and then we do individual interviews. So the first one, you know, we were kind of finding ourselves and, and we did one on uh, truth and reconciliation. The second one I think was on education. Our last one might've been on health, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we go to the experts and we we have the panel discussion and we have, like I said, little mini interviews in between the, the discussion. Um, part of it is, you know, we want buy-in from Sirius XM. And so I came up with this idea to ask other Sirius XM hosts to do those mini interviews with our guests because then it also promotes reconciliation, right? Because they get to hear the truth from our people. The non-Indigenous um, Sirius XM hosts have their worlds expanded. And, you know, hopefully down the road or even now that those Sirius XM hosts with their own shows start booking more Indigenous guests. Yes. So they have access to more 
Indigenous voices. And again, there's that whole lifting up of the community, right? And and it's not something, I mean, I guess it is calculated, but at the same time, it's, I just think that our voices deserve to be heard mm-hmm. everywhere. They do. And I love that. So in, in terms of, because I was thinking, it's a, such a good strategy, but at the same time, it's also very organic. Because if you support one person, then the other person's like, oh, I got to pass that on and make sure I mentor or support these other Indigenous peoples and lift their voices. And then it just becomes really contagious. And it makes us all feel really good about ourselves. Like the fact that the very first episode that you produced for Turtle Island Talks wins this award. I mean, that's got to say something because, you know, the host can jabber away all she wants, but it's the it's the concept, it's the idea, it's putting it together, it's negotiating the script. Who are we going to have on? Should we have Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples? What topics are we going to grapple with? That's all the work behind the scenes that no one ever sees. Yeah. Right. All people see is the finished product. Oh, look, it's Buffy St. Marie. <laughs> oh, look, you know, it's, uh, it's someone else. And right. but they don't know how much work goes behind it. Yeah. And so th- I think that's important to acknowledge. And, and Kim, fantastic job on that. And just for people. So, you know, Sirius XM in Digiverse is also something else that Kim has had a hand in. Now, for people who don't know, there's a difference between, you know, just Sirius XM in general, but what is Sirius XM in Digiverse? Because that's also something besides just Turtle Island Talks. Yeah, so Sirius XM in Digiverse is actually the channel, channel 165, that plays uh, all Indigenous music um, 24 seven. And it is also where my, my own radio show, the Kim Wheeler show lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so SXM, so SXM Indigiverse or the Indigiverse was previously known as the Canadian Aboriginal people's radio. Um, when, Indi- when Sirius XM approached me to come and do some work with them, they asked, you know, what, capacity would I like to work with them would I like to program the channel would I like to you know I don't know what else they asked they asked the pro they asked me to program the channel and I was like "Mm." you know I actually did that for CBC music so I've kind of already done that and I think you should probably look for somebody younger than me and um but I would be happy to come on and and mentor them uh, or consult with you guys and help them along. Um, but I think you should find somebody else to program the channel. And they came back to me and asked if I would host a show, which I thought was outrageous. And it took <laughs> them like six months to convince me to, to host my own show. Um, in the meantime, I helped them rebrand from Canadian Aboriginal People's Radio to the Indigiverse. Uh, which I thought that name up all by my little lonesome. Oh, see, that's you and your communications and promotions and media and like all of that goes together. And think about how awesome that is. So not only are you doing this awesome special Turtle Island Talks, and if anyone from SiriusXM is listening to this, you had better continue that because that is a fantastic award-winning show. But I'll set that aside. But the <laughs> Wheeler show is also really kick-ass because it's not your usual like when you hear that someone has a show you think okay it's news and current events all the time you know and there's a lot of that and that's not bad because that you know that's important stuff but you cover a whole range of things so sometimes i'm on there you know pontificating about current issues for indigenous peoples but then you're also talking to musicians you're also covering the arts you know so can you just talk a little bit more about what the Kim Wheeler show is. Yeah, so the Kim Wheeler show is a once a week uh, show that airs the same episode airs three times over the weekend, Friday, Saturdays and Sundays. And it's an unfiltered conversation with a person of my choice. (laughs) (laughs) I get to I get to host and produce my own show. And uh, basically, they just kind of handed me the keys to the kingdom and said, go and do what you want to do, Kim. (laughs) I was like, Okay. Okay. <laughs> you might uh, love that though. Yeah, I mean, it's like I still find it surreal, and yeah. and sometimes I think it's a lot of work, and do I want to keep doing this? And then I think, oh well, you took it 
because, you know, I felt like it would help elevate, um, I guess, elevate like who I am and my reach yeah. And, yeah. and get my name out there more because, you know, like on Turtle Island Talks, like I said, you're the star. Re, uh, Revision Quest, Daryl Dennis was the star. Unreserved, Rosanna Deerchild is the star. And it was actually Negan Sinclair who said to me shortly after the show started, he said, you know what, Kim? He goes, it's been so long that we've actually, I actually forgot that you have your own voice. And that's only Negan. Yeah. That's Negan because he has so many sisters that he can think in that kind of way. But how true is that? You're so busy behind the scenes, lifting up everybody else's voices. And here you have this powerful, cool, interesting, funny, quirky voice of your own. And now we get to hear it on the Kim Wheeler show. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. So I get to have all these in-depth conversations and people always go, okay, so what are we going to talk about? It's like, well, what do you want to talk about? And then we just let the show go where it naturally goes. And it's basically live to tape and, uh, and who knows, like, yeah. where the conversation is going to take you. It's like sitting down and having, you know, having tea with your auntie or having a yeah. beer at the, at the pub with your friend. And you know how those conversations go. They go everywhere. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, some people can really talk like a Jesse Wente and, and then other people, you know, sometimes you really have to pull it out of them when yeah. they're young and new, like Matt Mack, who is this incredible uh, musician from Garden Hill here in Manitoba. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and the fact that it's on Sirius satellite radio is pretty cool, Kim. You know, you're it's it, so you've got to continue with that in Sirius XM. You better continue with that show. But if that wasn't enough for everyone who's listening or watching or reading the closed captions, she just happens to also be the producer and ho one of the hosts of anti up and that's part of uh maqua media i think that's that's how it's pronounced so you've got to tell everyone about this podcast because it's one of those ones that just took the podcasting you know environment by storm it's one of the ones that i just love it's just so brutal and honest and funny and that the fact that it's all women that are doing this tell us about anti up podcast well, it's actually really simple. Auntie Up is Indigenous women talking about <laughs> important shit. <laughs> uh, we have a we have a great group of uh, hosts. We have, um, and I'm probably going to forget people, but we have, of course, Jolene Batting, who is the co-producer and host, along with myself. We're the ones who do all the heavy lifting. Tanya Talaga, whose company is Makwa Creative. She's our executive producer and pops in from time to time as a host. Uh, Stephanie Moses, Christine Genier, who is a former CBC broadcaster who famously quit on the air. <laughs> Uh, Rosanna Deerchild is sometimes our host. Uh, ooh, we've had Brandy Morin on as one of our as one of our hosts in season one. And yeah, and again, we wanted we wanted all these different hosts because we're not the expert in everything, and we don't know everything about everything, as Jolene says. And you know, although we like to think we know everything. <laughs> um, and we also wanted to give the opportunity to other Indigenous women to have a platform where they could come on and talk and share their expertise. So again, we only interview Indigenous women and each episode has themes and uh, yeah, it's all it's just about Indigenous women. And a show like this has never existed. No. Nope. Thank, you know, thank dog for podcasting because <laughs> this is without podcasting a show like this would never exist exactly exactly and that's you know it's literally a podcast on fire when you listen to it i mean there's some serious issues all the issues that we face as indigenous women or indigenous peoples in general um there's the struggle that's involved but there's also the way we use humor and support and love and kindness towards one another to support each other through it and just to be so honest and direct. And I love that it's not scripted, like question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Like the, the episode that I was on, you know, 
one person might only talk a little bit because that's all they have to say at the moment. Someone else might have like a whole lot to say and you guys just let it flow organically. And that's yeah. one of the things I appreciate about things like podcasts. Unlike say a radio station where it has to be produced to a certain length and certain time and ads and all of that stuff you really have a lot of freedom. You could have a four hour podcast if you wanted to, or a 40 minute podcast. And I think that freedom for indigenous women shows how on fire our voices are. And the fact that you have all of these different hosts. I mean, how many other shows really share the, share the love around, right? It's primarily just like a one person thing. And it's like, no, you guys are just sharing it all around and helping to lift up other people. And then Brandy Morin ended up having her own podcast. And I was like, look at the incubation you have done in all of your work, Kim. Honestly, I can't even get it all here on a one hour podcast. You're just doing such amazing work. And for me personally, I wanted the opportunity to thank you in front of everybody mm -hmm. because you have done so much to support me and I follow what you're doing and I try to emulate it. And wow, is it ever difficult? Um, well, I think you, I mean, you're obviously doing really amazing because look at the opening of this show and you're like in out these like two shot, single shot. Like my shows don't look like that. <laughs> so, and that should, that's the way it should be. Like other people coming up should be elevating what, you know, and building on what, is already there. I think that's amazing. Um, one of the things I do want to say, Pam, like when you talk about, you know, what I'm doing and what I've done and having, having creating and making space for other Indigenous voices that when I first started out in journalism and I started pitching positive Indigenous story, editors, didn't want to hear those stories and because they didn't th think that there was an audience for them, that there was a readership for them. Oh, wow. And more than once um, I was asked, don't you feel like you're ghettoizing yourself by telling only indigenous story? And I always said back to them, like, do you ask this of sports writers, political writers? Yeah. Do you ask this of the arts writers or the book reviewers. It's like, if I don't care about my community, who's going to care about it? Nobody. Right? And so it was a really long, hard push through my entire career to mm -hmm. be able to build a career on just Indigenous story. And that's probably why I've done so many different things mm -hmm. is because I had to look for different avenues yeah. and different platforms to get our stories out there and to stay relevant. It's so incredible to think that, so in a university context, why do you want to teach, you know, Indigenous stuff? That's just biased. You'll just be teaching in a biased manner. And, and you never think about it in the opposite way. Well, what about all of the Western European ideologies? Isn't that biased? Or what about the only the Western European English shows? Isn't that you know, just too focused on that. No one's going to want to hear that if it's all the same. Like, it's only just when it comes to us. And I think what people like you have shown is uh, not only do we want to hear it and need to hear it as Indigenous peoples, but Canadians have been, they didn't even know that they needed to hear these voices and these stories. They didn't know how much. And now Canadians, Americans, others can't get enough of it because they feel like they were cheated uh, in the education system. They were cheated in the media out of hearing voices and culture and real history and what's happening in the current struggle and how we can help and all of that stuff. So all of the hard knocks you took, you made it easier for a lot of other people. And I really appreciate that. And so as we wrap up, I always have two questions. Okay. Do you have a word of advice for say a 12 year old native girl saying, I wanna do what Kim Wheeler does. Do you have any advice for her? And two, how can Canadians help support people like you and every every other indigenous voice in media? Yeah, okay. So for the 12 year old, <laughs> I would say, if you're already writing, you're a writer. 
if you're already making little snippets of film and podcasts on, at home on your own, you're already a filmmaker and a podcast host. Um, just because you don't get paid for it doesn't mean that you're not doing it. And keep doing it and keep fighting and find spaces for your work. And if you get, can't find those spaces, publish it on your own. There's so many places you can put it out there. Um, call people like me. Reach out to us on social media. And there's a whole bunch of other Indigenous journalists out there who would love, I'm sure, to speak with you and encourage you and help mentor and guide you at, um, throughout throughout your career. So please reach out to us. For the, for the Canadian who's watching, find our voices. Find Indigenous storytellers. Find our podcasts. Find our TV shows. Buy our books. Buy the music. You know, support Indigenous when you can. And that's, you know, part of reconciliation, folks, is, is supporting the people who are out there telling our truths. You couldn't have said it any better. <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better. That literally is reconciliation. You know, open your mind, learn more so that you can take different actions. You can do more. You know, you can take actions for reconciliation, but also like... There's so many easy ways to support support Indigenous peoples, especially those who are in content creation or doing media. There's financial ways, right? If you're a, a large foundation, you can fund artists and people in the media, help support them with shows or development or creation or production companies, all of those things. Yeah. If you um, are an individual, you can help support them on Patreon, buy me a coffee, Ko-fi, uh, the, you know, GoFundMe, like all the different apps and projects and individual things that they're doing and they need just a little bit of a of, of support, you can support them that way. But even in free ways, you can listen. And once you've listened to whatever show or radio show it is or podcast, you can share it, you can like it, you can comment on it. And why is that important? Because it triggers the social media algorithm to say, hey, people like and are listening to what you're doing. So they're going to show the algorithm shows it out to so many other people who might not have been experienced and known what that indigenous content creator is. And then you can go on like anti up podcast, go on whatever your podcast host is and leave a really great review and make five stars because in our world, unfortunately there's going to be some trolls and haters who do their darndest to fight against Indigenous content, especially Indigenous women. So you have the power. Don't argue with them in the comments. That's a waste of time. Do things that contribute to Indigenous content creators like Kim's show and leave great reviews and share it. Use it in your classrooms as talking, you know, education, all of those things. And do what you can in your sphere of influence. Maybe you're a producer somewhere. Maybe you need to reach out more. Like reconciliation in media, there's so many opportunities. And so whether you have money or not, you all have a sphere of influence that you can use this to help support Indigenous content creators, especially in media like Kim. Oh, my goodness. I, I just... I can't thank you enough, Kim, for being on here. I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunities to actually work with you wow. when you're taking a chance on me when I haven't done anything in media. I don't know anything. I've not been educated in any of this stuff. I'm just like an angry political commentator. So I really, really appreciate it. And then for you're everyone not, else you're going to inform. Pam, you're not angry. You're <laughs> informed. Ah, yes. Okay. All right. Yes. I'm passionate. <laughs> How about the passionate? Yes, you're <laughs> yeah, very, yeah, yeah. for sure. You're very passionate. Oh, well, thank you, Kim. And make sure I will post links to everything we were talking about here so you can listen to all those shows if you haven't and uh, share them around. You're such a trailblazer, Kim. I'm honored to work with you. And to all the podcast listeners, thanks for always taking the time to listen and everything you do to fulfill our calls to action. Because this is not a podcast just for interest or entertainment. Education is about action. That's what reconciliation is. It's a verb. So what did you learn here and what can you do about it? That would be the greatest gift to all of us in terms of reconciliation. You taking action. And till next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliag. Well,
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting my podcast. Your donations help me keep the Warrior Life podcast open access to everyone and free from those annoying ads. And it's super simple. Just click on the link below to sign up for a Patreon monthly or yearly subscription or click the links for the Buy Me A Coffee app or the Kofi app to make one-time contributions. And if you belong to an awesome community group, business, or organization that's committed to Indigenous reconciliation, consider sponsoring an episode or two, or as many as you like. Thank you for helping me lift the voices of Indigenous warriors doing phenomenal things to help make our world a better place.